Hello, I'm David Fernandez, Legislative Specialist with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Today, on Arizona Wildlife Views, there are all kinds of fishing methods. Everything from fly fishing to spear fishing. But have you ever heard of electro fishing? Arizona Game and Fish shows you how it's done and why. Plus, did you know there are exotic, edible mushrooms growing wild right here in Arizona? We'll get a lesson on how to pick the right ones and how to avoid the ones that can make you sick. We've got all this and more today on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Arizona game and fish biologists routinely conduct fish surveys to better understand fishing communities. Today on Arizona Wildlife Views, we'll see how they're using the power of electricity to help increase the tiger trout population. We'll just be cruising. We'll cruise to the next site. I kind of want to cover most of the lake. It looks like something from science fiction, a metal monster stalking its prey in the shallows of a moonlit lake. We do it at night because most of the fish come up to the shallows or in the shallows in the evening and at night, um, and we get higher catch rates. It looks like science fiction, but it's purely science fact. This is a, a boat electro fisher. We actually have a generator on the boat, which produces the electricity that'll be running while we're fishing. So we're actually putting uh, electricity into the water and it just stuns the fish. Electro fishing is a safe and effective tool that Game and Fish uses to survey fish populations. The whole point of the survey is to catch the fish without harming them. We're pulling them out as fast as possible of the water, and they're usually revived by the time we get them in the live well. They're nice and swimming around in there. This particular survey at Willow Springs Lake is focused <laughs> exclusively on tiger trout. That's a tiger trout. Tiger! When another species like this bass is scooped up by mistake, it's immediately released. There's a rainbow. I'll let him go. You guys ready? Yeah. Yeah. Every 30 minutes, the biologists cut the power and start measuring fish. Yeah, look at him. Three, four, one. So we've got a species code, which I'm using TIGR uh, for tiger trout. And then I have the length in millimeters and the weight in grams. Here's a good one. Tiger trout are new to Arizona. In the summer of 2016, Game and Fish stocked them into four Arizona lakes. Carnero and Becker in the White Mountains, Woods Canyon and Willow Springs Lake on the Mogollon Rim. It's now November and biologists are collecting data to serve as a baseline for when they do this again in the spring. 122. We're surveying the tiger trout this time of year to figure out how healthy they're going to be going into the winter. Game and fish biologist Sally Petrie says there's a lot to learn about tiger trout and their ability to survive and thrive in Arizona's lakes. About 7,300 tiger trout were stocked into Willow Springs Lake. It also got about 51,000 rainbow trout. So tigers accounted for about 14% of all fish stocked here in 2016. We're trying to give our anglers just something else to fish for other than our regular rainbow trout. Tiger trout, are they're a cross between a brook trout and a brown trout. Tiger trout are a sterile hybrid that cannot reproduce. They're aggressive feeders, which can make them especially fun to catch. 
I'm doing some angler surveys, kind of just asking people, hey, how are you liking fishing for tiger trout? What are you catching them on? And people really like them. They think they look really cool, and they do look really cool. Um, and they, they say that they are more, more aggressive on the line. So they're a little bit more of a fight to get in the boat, which is, which is fun. Yeah, these tiger trout are real fun fish to catch. Earlier in the day, Nick Walter, who edits the weekly fishing report for Game and Fish, was at Willow Springs Lake hoping to hook one of the new arrivals. They'll chase down your lures, anything like a panther martin or a cast master or a rooster tail, and it's perfect for fly fishing. Oh, beautiful tiger trout. It's the first one I've ever caught, so first tiger. They're aggressive fish, they'll chase down your fly, so Tiger trout and fly fishing is a win-win out here. Ready? Back on the boat, the first half hour of electro fishing was Good productive. Good job, you got them. Uh, so we got 15 tiger trout, which is pretty exciting. We're doing pretty good for tonight so far. But it got even better. The best half hour produced 32 tiger trout, and a grand total of 99 were surveyed by the time the team finished its work around midnight. Two, four, four. The average size of the tiger trout was 10.7 inches and about half a pound. The smallest was 8.8 .8 inches, not quite a quarter pounder, and the biggest was just under a pound and slightly more than 13 inches long. There's no telling how the tiger trout will do here during the winter, but we should find out in the spring when these researchers are back chasing tigers in their stunning science machine. I'm Jim Warnicke, a retired fisheries program manager from the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Ah. And a mushroom foraging enthusiast. Oh, wow. A stump full of oyster mushrooms. What a find. He's hunting for Easter eggs, the kind that show up in the summer along with the monsoon rains. We're out here in the, uh, in the uh, White Mountains around Mount Baldy. I really like getting out. I, you know, I think all biologists were uh, created uh, collectors and so forth, and so I love to come out and uh, participate in this Easter egg hunt, if you will, uh, for mushrooms, for fungi in the forest. Although I can see that there have been people through the area picking here, I don't think they got all of them. At least I hope not. Oh, yeah. They didn't get this big boy. Nice choice edible, King will eat. A word of warning, wild mushrooms can be delicious, but they can also be deadly. Never eat a mushroom unless you're absolutely certain it's safe. When in doubt, throw it out. You wanna have the positive ID, not only from books, but a local expert. Beautiful aspen bleed. I encourage people to seek uh, information from the Arizona Mushroom Society. It's called now, it used to be the Arizona Mushroom Club. Warnicky is becoming an expert himself. He produced a DVD, Arizona's 11 Most Edible Mushrooms, to educate and inspire folks to get out and enjoy the diversity of fungi in the forest. They're the jewels of the forest floor is what I like to call mushrooms. So it's, it's really neat not just to be out here, but to start to understand uh, what's going on in the, the forest floor. So I think that we're uh, probably in the right area that there's going to be another thunderstorm on us here and it's going to wet, wet the place down and uh, our uh, mushrooms are going to continue to pop up and uh, we'll continue to forage and find them and enjoy ourselves. <laughs> Since we're right at the edge of the meadow, there's a lot of grassy spots butted up right against the, the conifers, the, the fir trees there. And because the king beliefs are associated with the roots of those trees, uh, the roots come all the way out here. And a lot of times you'll find those king beliefs uh, in the grasses. 
you know, you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, and you know, and all of a sudden you see a nice, <laughs> you know, orange cap like this. You go, oh, is that an edible one, or is it not an edible one? You know, you go over and look, and you feel underneath, and you feel those sponge tubes, and you go, ah, it's Boletus. It's one that I, I can eat. What we'll do is we'll just wiggle it back and forth and pull him out like that. Here's, instead of gills, he has sponge tubes right here. This seems like a great specimen. We're gonna clean him up. I'm gonna shave him. We'll go all the way around and get the dirt off of him. Indeed, there isn't any bug holes in the bottom here. This guy looks like a virginal specimen. No bugs to contend with. A prime specimen of King Belit Mushroom. These oysters are fairly easy to tell apart from others that grow on stumps. You turn it over and you can see they have a very, very short stem right here. They're a gilled mushroom and they're actually kind of a clamshell shape like that and that's why they're known as, as oyster mushrooms. These are the ones that would go really well if you were sauteing them and putting them onto your uh, big old T-bone steak. Cut them right close to the stump like that, and everything we're cutting off is edible. Not much trimming necessary. Ooh, look at this. Some chanterelles. A gourmet mushroom. Smell a little bit like apricots. Here's a good find. Wow. Look at that bad boy. Cut this little end part off there. Oh, look how nice and white he is. Feels pretty solid, man. Beautiful white king bolete. Oh, wow. Look at this. Or if these are what I think they are, they look like a, an almond agaric. They smell a little bit like almonds. They taste uh, close to a portobello, a, a little bit sweeter. It has these, uh, these brown gills, agaricus is the, is the genera, and actually the button mushroom, the portobello mushroom, are all members of that particular family, that genera. I'll wiggle them out, turn them over. These are fungus gnat larvae, maggots. I'm not going to eat him. <laughs> these are lobsters. I call them the 50 mile an hour mushrooms because you can spot them going 50 miles an hour down the dirt road because they're so brightly colored. They are actually a parasite on the other mushrooms. And they're called lobster mushrooms because they're kind of shaped a little bit like a lobster's claw. A friend of mine likes to make lobster bisque and use lobster mushrooms because they taste so much like seafood. I like lobster mushrooms because they, they uh, not only because of the way they taste, but they remain fairly firm and crisp. So when you put them in soups and so forth, they don't get soggy or mushy or anything like that, is that they have a very nice texture, uh, a nice uh, mild flavor. So they end up going in a bag by themselves because they're dirty, dirty little boys. Excellent specimens of King Belit. We did exceptionally well, you know, for the three hours or so that we were out there, we got a good uh, diversity, probably six or seven different uh, species of uh, edible mushrooms and some of them really, you know, epicurean quality. Let's go find some more. So much country to cover. We've got 20 years of cooperative, collaborative conservation. So our first site was Arbery Valley in 1996. And then in 2007, we had Babbitt Ranches join under a safe harbor. And today, um, the Double O Ranch is going to become our third official site in Arizona, and they're going to be under a safe harbor agreement. So we're standing on the third official site for ferret reintroductions. So thank you, everybody. In October of 2016, Arizona Game and Fish celebrated a milestone for its work with endangered black-footed ferrets. 2016 marked our 20th anniversary of releasing ferrets in Arizona. They weren't sure if ferrets were going to make it here, but the project's been a success. Back in 1996, Game and Fish released ferrets for the very first time in the Aubrey Valley near Seligman, Arizona. It's great habitat because it's prime prairie dog country, and prairie dogs are the number one food source for ferrets. 
Now six more are being released on the Double O Ranch, the newest private property owner to partner with the Ferret Project. Other partners that make ferret conservation possible include the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Phoenix Zoo. For Phoenix Zoo, it is the 25th year um, of working with them. And we've had an average of uh, 20 ferrets born a year uh, at this facility. The zoo started raising ferrets in 1991. It's one of six captive breeding facilities that raises ferrets for release at 28 sites across eight western states, Mexico, and Canada. Without facilities like this, black-footed ferrets would probably no longer exist. In the 1970s, they were thought to be extinct. Then, in 1981, a small colony was discovered in Wyoming. Several years later, disease nearly wiped them out, but 18 ferrets were captured and placed into a captive breeding program. We have to pay attention to the behaviors that they need to survive, like being able to catch food. Breeding facilities like the Phoenix Zoo are challenged with raising ferrets in captivity that are ready for the wild. Uh, predator avoidance behaviors, like they, we don't want them to stay up above ground for very long. So that behavior of them taking the food down, that's something we're definitely paying attention to. If we see them eating up top for prolonged periods of time or not taking that food down, uh, it's definitely something to note. It could be an animal that is potentially not fit for release. What you see at this facility are these enclosures that have a surface area, but they also have a tunnel that goes down to a nest box. In a way, this setup, even though it doesn't look at all like a prairie dog town, it's actually the identical kind of habitat resource that they would need. Monitoring Arizona's ferret population isn't easy because ferrets are nocturnal. Their food source prairie dogs, they're out all day long, but the ferrets, they like to go in the burrows at night and take a prairie dog while they're sleeping, so. So several times a year, volunteers help Game and Fish conduct spotlighting surveys. So you're gonna be driving five to 10 miles an hour. Um, you're just gonna be sweeping your spotlight back and forth. The night begins with an orientation. Uh, that just kind of helps you to know where roughly you're going to see ferrets most likely. Volunteers learn how to find ferrets and how to capture them with a trap. And push up this door as such. Well, last night um, we saw three badgers, uh, saw two of the black-footed ferrets, trapped one. Volunteer Robert Coonrod is a spotlighting regular. I enjoy it. It's like, they're, it's my vacation. Like getting away from the city. We're driving around usually about three miles an hour and we're looking for eye shine. That's a badger, but ferrets have that same brilliant green eye shine. And when you see the green eye shine, we stop the truck, we try to locate the ferret, see which hole he's gone down, then we'll place a trap, only if we can guarantee that that's the hole that the ferret went down, uh, and then we come back and check those traps every hour. This is a confirmed sighting, yes. <laughs> On this night, Robert didn't catch a ferret, but other spotlighters did. They'll bring it into our processing RV, Every ferret gets a microchip if they don't have one already, and they're immunized against plague and canine distemper. We'll give it a shot of penicillin. We'll take its vitals. Uh, we'll pluck some hair for a DNA sample. After a ferret is processed, the spotlighters release it where they found it. It's a good feeling that you're trying to, to bring back an animal that was declared extinct twice. Maybe one day this endangered species will simply be a common species. Now that would be something to celebrate. There's still a lot of work to be done. So you want to hunt big game in Arizona. First, you need a valid hunting license, then you need to apply for a hunt permit tag, then you have to win the lottery. Well, sort of. To hunt big game in Arizona, most of our hunts are a limited draw, and so you have to submit an application to be drawn for that particular tag. Amber Munich, the big game management supervisor for Game and Fish, is here to help us navigate the draw process, which can be tricky at times. Our draw is complex in Arizona, but it's because we have a limited resource and high demand for those limited resources. And so in order to make it fair for everybody 
to draw a tag at some point, we've put these restrictions on how the draw operates. Now before we get into how the draw works, let's start with the basics, like the hunt permit tag. You need one of these for most of Arizona's big game hunts. There are dozens of hunts to choose from, organized by species, weapon type, hunting area, and characteristics that make an animal legal to harvest. Now the odds of drawing a tag vary from hunt to hunt. If you're applying for our deer hunts on the Arizona Strip, which are, which are units 13A and 13B, the odds are much less than 1%. It comes down to supply and demand, how many tags are available and how many hunters apply for those tags. If you choose hunts that are not as high demand, then those draw odds improve. And of course, if you're looking for something like antlerless elk, then you have a pretty good chance, oftentimes a 50% chance at drawing those tags. Each hunt in Arizona is assigned a unique number to use when applying for a tag. On your application, you may select up to five hunt numbers in order of preference. Then, after you submit a properly completed application on time and with the required payment, you are entered in the draw. Your application will be assigned a computer-generated random number. It's the lowest numbers that get the first shot at a tag. And you get extra chances to be issued a low random number if you have bonus points. As you apply for a hunt and you're unsuccessful in, the, in drawing a tag, you get awarded a bonus point. So every time you're unsuccessful for that species, you start to accumulate bonus points. And the bonus points give you extra chances of getting low random numbers in the draw, which improves your odds of drawing that tag. Your bonus points accrue over time until you're finally drawn for a hunt. You can also get a bonus point if you complete Arizona's hunter education course, and that's a permanent bonus point and it applies to all species. The other way is if you have applied for a species for five consecutive years, you're issued what's called a loyalty bonus point. That point isn't cumulative, it's either present or absent. So if you end up missing a year, it goes away. You may also use the hunt application to basically buy a bonus point instead of entering the draw. Now that we're familiar with permit tags, hunt numbers, and bonus points, let's take a look at how Arizona's big game draw process works. Our draw has three different passes to it or phases to the draw. The first pass is what we call our 20% bonus point pass. This first phase of the draw awards 20% of all available tags to applicants with the highest number of bonus points. Let's use elk for an example. If there are 100 total tags that we're issuing for a hunt number, 20 of those will be issued during the bonus pass of our draw. Let's say there are 22 maximum points for elk. We pull up all applications with 22 points. Each of those applications is issued a random number. The lowest random number is the one that comes up first. That application gets their first choice. We go to the next lowest random number and look at their first choice. If a tag is available, they get that choice. If there's not a tag available, we look automatically at their second choice. If there's a tag available there, they receive it. If not, their whole application goes back in the pool for the next phase of our draw. And we go through each application this way until we've gone through everybody who has 22 bonus points. If we haven't issued the entire 20% of those tags in this bonus pass, then we drop down to the next number, which is 21. We do the same thing, looking at their first choice, looking at their second choice, then we'll drop down to the next lowest number and the next lowest until we've issued the entire 20% in this pass. Once that 20% is gone, then we go into the second phase of our draw. This is where it becomes truly a random draw, more of a lottery. We're issuing the remaining 80% of the tags here. You get a random number for your application, and you get a random number for each bonus point that you have. So if I have 10 bonus points, I'm getting 11 random numbers, one for my application and one for each bonus point. We look at an application's first choice, issue the tag if it's available. If it's not, then we automatically look at the second choice. If neither choice is available, which means that all tags for that hunt have been issued, that application goes back in the bucket for the third pass of our draw, which is where we look at the third, fourth, and fifth choice on a hunt application. So that's Arizona's big game draw process. It's the same for non-Arizona residents, except non-residents are limited to no more than 10% of all available big game tags. 
The 10% cap pertains to each individual hunt for most species except bighorn sheep and bison, where the cap is applied to all hunts combined. And that's because there's so few tags offered for bighorn sheep and buffalo in the state. Again, I do want to emphasize that the tags for non-residents aren't guaranteed, it's just up to 10%. And only half of that 10% may be issued in the first phase of the draw. So in a hunt that has 100 tags, 10 of them are available to non-residents to be drawn. Five of the 10 can be issued in the bonus pass of our draw. So that's where we look at max bonus points. And the remainder, the remaining five, may be issued in the second phase of our draw. Arizona's big game draw is designed to give everyone a chance to enjoy the thrill and the privilege of hunting the state's big game species. Good luck next time you put in for the draw. That's going to do it for this episode of Arizona Wildlife Views. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to join us again next week and get out there and enjoy those Arizona wildlife views.